Now I invite Professor K. Sri Kumar to chair the session. Professor K. Sri Kumar is the professor and head of the Department of Applied Chemistry, QSAT. He is actively working in the area of polymer chemistry, catalysis, and green chemistry, particularly focusing on polymers as aids in organic synthesis, polymer supported dendritic nanoparticles as catalyst, modified clay supported transmission, transition metal complexes as heterogeneous catalyst, photochemistry of synthetic polymers, polymers for optoelectronics and photonics. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this great event. Uh, besides me, uh, Professor Yusuf Hisidi. And this time, uh, we have an eminent teacher from the University of Kerala, uh, Dr. Anidipti, uh, for this giving this endowment lecture. Professor y KK Muhammad Yusuf Endowment Lecture was instituted in this department in 2010 uh, when Professor Yusuf retired. And it was uh, continuing for the last 10 years. Uh, eminent personalities have given this lecture. And now being an alumnus of uh, the Supplied Chemistry Department, uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Anidipti uh, to give this lecture. Anidipti had her MSc from this department. Uh, she had her PhD from NIST Trivandrum, former RRL Trivandrum, with Professor Vijay Nair in organic synthesis. Uh, later, she had worked in National University of Singapore for a year with Prof. Uh, Dr. Suresh Valiavitil. Then uh, she had joined Amrita Institute at Kuala as a lecturer. Then she moved to the University of Kerala as an assistant professor in 2012. And she is continuing there. Probably by this time, she might have become an associate professor, I think. <coughs> and uh, Dr. Anidipti is interested in organic synthesis, uh, especially heterocyclic synthesis. Uh, polycarbonyl compounds and so on. And particularly, she is interested in methodology development of uh, related to organic synthesis. I'm happy to welcome uh, Dr. Anidipti to this endowment lecture. And now I hand over the mic to Dr. Anidipti for giving her lecture. Anidipti. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, shall I start sharing my screen? Okay, you can share. Okay. Sir, but there, I think uh, some uh, the host has to do because it is given host disabled the participant screen sharing. So, some technique. I'm not able to share the screen. Ma'am, one minute, one minute, one minute. Okay, okay. Ma'am, just try once more. Yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. Now it's fine. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, very good afternoon to all of you there. And uh, I'm, uh, indeed, it's an honor and my privilege. And let me first of all at the outset thank all the organizers of MADCON, especially Dr. Srigumar sir and uh, Dr. Naibin for the kind invitation. So I can see all my gurus sitting on in the hall there. So I bow my head before all of them. So, and uh, I'll be uh, focusing on uh, talking on our small research on small molecules which possess biological or photophysical properties. But before going into the talk as such, and I also want to tell something about the department, which I'll keep for the end. So, but, and before going to the topic, let me pay a tribute to two great organic chemists who passed away exactly an year back. One is Professor, uh, sorry. 
Mine is Professor Rolf Yusjen. I'm sorry. Yeah. So Professor Rolf Yusjen actually passed away in 26 March 2020. He is well known as the father of one three dipolar cycloadditions to all of us. And a look into Professor Houston's uh, uh, life will show that he is a student of Professor Wieland. And Wieland was a very prominent organic chemist of the first half of 20th century. He was working and uh, Houston was one among his last students. And he worked on strychnose alkaloids for his PhD. And we should remember that the key success tools at those times were crystallization, distillation, and chemical degradation processes. And Houston established the area of 1-3 dipolar cycloadditions, which has crossed all borders of organic chemistry and now gone to material science and many such aspects. And Angered, they had published a review in, uh, to, in, as a memoriam to Professor Houston, uh, titling it as the milestones of 1-3 dipolar cycloaddition. But unfortunately, uh, Professor Houston was uh, overlooked by the Nobel Committee and he never received a Nobel Prize. The well-known Sharpless uh, click chemistry actually originated from Houston. Sharpless received the Nobel Prize in 2001, but Professor Houston never received it. And if we further look into the uh, work, research works of Professor Houston, we'll understand that uh, Houston was very keen not only about the structure and synthesis, but he was also very keen on the mechanistic and kinetic aspects of reactivity. And these are some molecules uh, with which Professor Houston has done a lot of contribution regarding the nitrosoamides, N-phenyl pentazoles, benzynes, cyclotetrine. So he was very uh, uh, studying the kinetics of all such sort of reactions. And of course, the 1-3 dipolar cycloaddition is the most known of that. And it's the most versatile method in heterocyclic chemistry, which has led to the, uh, contributed a lot to many other areas as well. And 2019, um, Elsevier has published a book entitling it as the Modern Applications of Cycloaddition Chemistry, where we can see the triazole compounds being used for having antiviral activity and some of the triazole compounds as anti-cancer activity. So they are all uh, seeked in molecules now. And these are some few examples just to show that how it has crossed the boundaries of cycloaddition chemistry and it has uh, uh, actually gone to uh, material science. So you can see functionalized fullerenes here, as well as these are hydrogels obtained from click chemistry. So all this uh, are about uh, so contributions of Professor Houston, where, uh, which has crossed the boundaries of organic synthesis. So now uh, let me tell you about just one more scientist and then I will go to the work. So this is Professor Stuart Warren. He left us on 22nd March, 2020. So again, a year back. And those who cannot recognize him from his image will definitely recognize him from his books. One is the organic synthesis disconnection approach, which has taught uh, generations of uh, students the art of organic synthesis. And this is a very famous book by uh, organic chemistry known as Clayden. Actually, this was co-authored by Clayden Greaves, Stuart Warren and others. And Clayden and Greaves were students of Warren. And, uh, that is also an excellent contribution. And uh, we look into the research works of Stuart Warren again. Stuart Warren did a lot of work on the phosphorus and sulfur chemistry, with uh, emphasize, emphasizing their pseudo chemistry. But uh, he is known more as the author of numerous textbooks with a student centric style, which has inspired a lot of students to organic synthesis. And last year, again, the Royal Society of Chemistry published an obituary article in OBC. Uh, uh, after the demise of Professor Stotter. So with this uh, tribute, let me move to uh, the work that I would like to talk about. So these are some ongoing explorations in our lab. So in Karivatam for the past few years. So here we we'll concentrate mainly on the, um, what is it, the synthesis of small molecules. And we try to look in for some application for those small molecules. So, because our department is also oriented towards uh, an application. So, uh, so one uh, area that I, I was, I we felt interested was this, this is a small molecules which can act as anti-cancer agents. So why, because cancer, you know, is a pressing problem in uh, globally. And uh, if we look into, this is actually a Times of India report, which came published five years back, it's a little bit old, but still the statistics will not be very different now and which they have entitled as cancer is just not killing Indians, but it is killing India too. And these are the five more states in India 
which are uh, really facing a problem that includes Kerala, Mizoram, Haryana, Delhi, and Karnataka. And the statistics say that in out of 1 lakh people in India, 106 are ca cancer patients, while in Kerala, out of 1 lakh, 135 are cancer patients. And these are the different uh, uh, things. Uh, so we thought that uh, we should do something in this. And so then where can the organic chemists contribute here? So if you think about cancer, cancer-based drugs, chemotherapy, chemotherapy targets at certain interactions which we can look into. And one very well-known interaction which can be looked into is the MDM2P53 interaction. So that is a well-known cancer chemotherapeutic target which is found to be efficient also. So just a little about that. So P53 is the uh, protein which is tumor suppressing protein. And P53 is the one which is responsible to activate BACs. BACs is the apoptotic uh, produ inducing protein. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So, and what happens is in during a situation like cancer, uh, the uh, protein called MDM2 gets overexpressed. And the overexpression of MDM2 will cause its interaction with P53, thus inactivating the P53 and therefore inactivating the BACs. So, and uh, the amino acids responsible in P53 for this blockage are the phenylalanine, tryptophan, and leucine. And uh, chem chemotherapy targets in uh, adding or uh, uh, giving to the patient inhibitor molecules, which can inhibit this uh, interaction by binding to MDM2. So the inhibitor molecule will have some amino acids, which will correspond to the P53 amino acids, and it binds to the MDM2. And well-known uh, chemotherapeutic drugs using peptides are known. But the problem with peptide-based drugs is that it's, uh, uh, the peptides are prone to aerolysis inside cells and you have to do larger dosage. And regarding the MDM2 interaction also, its interaction is very low. Then in 2004, a group of molecules called nutlins were developed. Nutlins are basically uh, imidazole compounds. So these nutlins were actually now given as drugs and uh, properties that nutlins don't cause the cell death, but it can cause P53 activation. So it is given as a comb in the combination, used in combination drug therapy with uh, known cancer killing uh, drugs. And uh, another sort of molecules is spiroxindoles. And I actually, we are going to focus on these spiroxindoles. And spiroxindoles, these are well known. This uh, MI888 was discovered in 2005. And all these compounds are in the phase three clinical trials now as good P53 activators, which can be uh, taken up further uh, to the drug discovery level. So uh, we, why we were interested in these pyroxindoles is that, one, it can be obtained from the classical Houston one dipolar cyclodition of azomethanylates with alkrophiles, um, uh, dipolarophiles, I'm sorry. So, and all, the second case is when you, the, it is very important that these inhibitor molecule, the stereochemistry should be fixed because stereochemistry plays a very important role in the binding with the MDM2 protein. So again, Houston reaction can give you, without any other catalyst, you can go, get a single stereoisomer. So we got interested in this. And as an initial, uh, and these are some papers which shows the uh, very recent papers. This, is came, this came out last year in European, last week in European Journal of Medicinal Chemistry which des describes the anti-cancer potential of spiro compounds. And this is a group from Naipur, Hyderabad. And uh, this is at another paper. This is from Imperial College and where they again uh, stress on the stereocyclic synthesis and applications of spirocyclic oxindole. So these molecules have received a lot of attention now and, a lot, and many groups are work working on such synthesis of such compounds. So we started our study by actually just taking a very uh, simple reaction uh, of the, generating the azomethanyl lead from isatins and uh, sarcosin amino acid and adding it to heterocyclic illidines. And we ended up in the synthesis of such type of azomethanyl leads. This, this was done as a part of an MPhil project. And um, we act, uh, after that, we could synthesize this and uh, get the extract crystal showing that that's a single stereoisomer. We have synthesized a lot of commons in this series. And we did the biological studies in our with association with Dr. Biju of the biochemistry department in our campus. And what uh, we found out is that the anti-cancer activity was actually tested against the human melanoma skin cancer A375 uh, cell line using cisplatin standard. And there was no significant decline in the cell viability, uh, even at a lower concentration. So that means they, these molecules do not kill the cells. 
But at the same time, these molecules were found to influence apoptosis by activating the P53 and caspase 7. Both are apoptotic pathway intermediates. So therefore, such kinds of molecules are considered as therapeutically advantageous because this uh, is not only, uh, this is not causing the cellular necrosis or the killing of the cells, but in, it influences apoptosis. And this paper was recently highlighted in one of the anti-cancer uh, journals uh, regarding the uh, therapeutic efficiency. So actually we did this study as just an uh, starting and we were more interested in uh, synthesis of dispyro compounds because what has, this has just one spirocenter you can see here. So what happens if you uh, synthesize dispyro compounds, how is their activity going to be? So uh, this is this reaction was done by my student Vidya. So she, what she did is she again, uh, we uh, synthesized the isomethanolate from the isatin and sarcosin and we added it to a dipolar file, which, is, which was made in our lab. And we obtained this compound in 97% yield as a single isomer. And were, I got the extra crystal of that. And uh, we have the crystal was in, made in methanol. So we have methanol co-crystal also along with that. And this compound precipitated out an excellent yield. We could do this reaction in methanol, but then we tried some more cleaner solvents. So we used the deputectic solvent, uh, acetylcholinide and ethylene glycol mixture at 40 degrees centigrade at two hours give you this product. And again, uh, this compound, uh, so to synthesis, in order to get to this compound, we had to synthesize the dipolar file. And the dipolar file was, uh, it is an, uh, it's the first time we are synthesizing the dipolar file. And it is synthesized from the corresponding thiene 2 3 b indole dione. So this thiene 2 3 b indole dione is in turn synthesized from such type of uh, indoles, thioindoles. And uh, the property of this dion is that this, even though it is a 1,2 dicarbonyl compound, it has a nucleophilic property rather than an electrophilic property. So we tried adding a powerful electrophile like dimethyl acetylene dicarboxylate to this. And uh, we ended up with the synthesis of this particular dipolarophile. Okay. So that is how we synthesize the dipolarophile for our 3 plus 2 cycloaddition. And using this chemistry, we have synthesized a lot of dispyro compounds. And um, uh, all, in, all came out in very good deals. We used proline, thioproline, tryptophan, and many other amino acids also for this uh, synthesizing this uh, series of compounds. So our next objective was to uh, see, seek the anti-cancer potential of this compound, or whether it will act as anti-cancer agent. So initially, we have done a molecular docking study in our bioinformatics department using the Discovery Studio software. So the reference pyroxindol drug chosen was this particular drug. There you can see that uh, this uh, docks with the MDM2 protein. So we are trying to dock the molecule with the MDM2 proteins to see the fitting. And in case of the reference drug, it is uh, we surmise that the uh, fitting is due to the presence of this indole ring, which can mimic the indole ring, in the tryptophan residue of P53. And here the phenyl ring can mimic the phenyl, phenyl alanine part in the P53 amino acid. Same way, our compound also, out of all our compounds, this particular compound was found to have highest docking score. And here again, uh, we attribute it to the uh, indole containing units and the phenyl ring, and of course, the spiral functionality. And uh, this shows the fitting of the molecule inside the, the image showing the fitting and the hydrogen bonding interactions which come out from this molecule and with the protein. And these compounds are actually, uh, the, we submitted these compounds uh, last year to our department of biochemistry, but uh, in between the lockdown, uh, the cell, their cells got damaged. So still they are studying our compounds for the in vitro activity. Okay, so with this, so that is our explorations on uh, this uh, key. Uh, so we have, um, one of my students will be presenting a poster also at, after the session, where we, are, we have synthesized another set of uh, these diaspora compounds using isomethanolates generated from tetrahydroisocanolates. So all these reactions go very well. So with this, uh, I'll, I'll be, let me just tell you uh, about the mechanism also, because it's very interesting that you are just getting a single product. So if you're really looking into this, the isomethanolate is generated by the interaction of the isatin and sarcosin. So that is how you get that. But when you come to uh, this addition of the, the regio chemistry of this addition, uh, the elite, uh, you can see that the elite negative charge can, there are two possibilities. One, it can attack the carbon, in which, which carries the carbomethoxy, or another is it can attack the carbon, which is attached to sulfur. So uh, we have two pathways. But what happens is in pathway, if the elite takes the pathway A, where the negative charge is attacking to the carbon containing the carbomethoxy, 
there is a possibility of secondary orbital interaction which stabilizes the transition state. So we surmise that this is the reason why you are getting this product. And uh, we have theoretical uh, backing for this work from the previous azomethanilid uh, chemistry. And regarding the stereochemical approach, again, the elite can actually approach in an exo manner or an endo manner to the dipolarophile. And dipolarophile has two phases. It has a psi phase and a ray phase. So when the elite approaches in an endo manner to either to the psi phase or the ray phase, what happens is that there is considerable steric repulsion. Whereas when the elite approach on the psi phase through the exo manner, again, there are some uh, steric hindrance. But uh, when the elite approaches the exo manner to the ray phase, uh, there is considerable relief in the steric hindrance. And therefore, we surmise that the approach of the elite should be to the exo ray phase approach. We have done the theoretical calculations to support our stereochemistry of the product by calculating the J values also by the help of Dr. J. Shri. Okay. So this is about our explore, ongoing explorations on anti-cancer activity. So with this, let me now move to the next part of my talk, where we have synthesized some molecules, which can act as potential antibacterial agents. So in this uh, perspective, just before going into that, let me just uh, tell you what this, uh, this anti, why is this antibacterial activity becoming so important now? And if you look into the WHO newsroom, you can see that this is a pressing issue because, and these uh, and back antibiotics or uh, the microbes are getting resistant to the uh, available antibiotics. And these microbes are called superbugs. There is a very good documentary based on this the rising of the superbugs. And United Nations has already estimated that about 10 million people will be killed by 2050 due to this superbugs. And by that time, the mortality due to the antibiotic resistance is going to be exceed that of cancer. So today we are talking about coronavirus and the vaccines. So very soon uh, in the future, we'll be talking about the bacteria which are resistant to all the available antibiotics. So who has actually pointed out uh, six uh, pathogens? They are called the escape pathogens, which includes the Enterococcus fecum, the Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsiella pneumonia, Acinobacter, Bomeni, Pseudomonas, Enterobacteriaceae, etc. And has seen uh, sudden urgent attention for the, to the scientist community to look for medicines for all these, uh, which can attack uh, antibiotics for all these uh, species. And if we look into the mechanism of antibiotic action, we can see that uh, the bacteria is actually uh, a living cell and the cell has a cell membrane and most of the small molecule inhibitors uh, starting from the penicillin discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928 and its congeners like the cephalosporin, carbopenems, etc. All of them attack this bacterial cell wall. Another strategy is to add, uh, look at the activity toward the proteins inside the bacteria, inhibit the protein synthesis and that is what the tetracycline the gecycline and many other macrolide antibiotics are uh, doing. And another approach is to inhibit the nucleic acid synthesis, which is inside the cell. And that is exactly how the nitrofurantoin, mitra, metronidazole, such antibiotics do that. So we were again interested in the synthesis of small molecules and small molecules attack the cell wall of the bacteria, which can be active against the cell wall of the bacteria. Again, if we look into recent literature, you can see what is the role of small molecules. So this is a paper which came out uh, in 2019. Uh, the group is in uh, JNCSR Bangalore. So they have identified a small anti this, uh, antibacterial molecule, which is active against the drug resistant strains of Staphylococcus. And what they have found is uh, tetraalkyl ammonium salt uh, attached to alkyl chains can act as uh, are the, are the molecules that they were looking into. And this is at another very recent article which came on the small bacteria having a specific membrane activity. So these are hydendoin, what they synthesize were hydendoin based molecules which can act against the cell, uh, cell membrane. And these are some examples of uh, some molecules which are all in the phase three clinical trials for antibacterial activity against drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus and uh, enterobacteria, et cetera. Okay, so, the, so, so we thought this is a very important thing to look into. And what we uh, looked into was, uh, got interested was in this particular uh, uh, thing, which is called the two amino, the three cyano unit, two amino, three cyano unit. And this is a co lead compound in pharmaceutical arena. It is a well-known compound. It is two amino, three cyano pyridine. So the activity of this compound has somewhat attributed to this particular motif. So we looked into the, the possibility of heterocyclic synthesis carrying this motif. 
So as an initial reaction, we have uh, just done uh, one, uh, synthesized the spiropyrene oxindole employing acetone 1,3 dicarboxylate. You can see the acetone 1,3 dicarboxylate unit here. And we reacted it with uh, isatilidine derived LED. And then uh, we did a simple uh, base catalyzed reaction. We'll give you this two amino spiroxindoles. But uh, we tested the bacterial activity of this, but these compounds did not have appreciable antibacterial activity. So then we thought we'll now try the sulfur analog of this molecule. Uh, so, uh, and we looked into the literature. We found a lone report by Majumdar, KC Majumdar et al. in 2012, where they have synthesized this particular molecule containing the two amino thiopyrin unit, but uh, they have not looked into the antibacterial properties, uh, et cetera, of that compound. And we synthesized the same compound through another methodology, another strategy, employing uh, employing our uh, this molecule that is a thiophene uh, thiene two three bene two three diode and isatilidines and we ended up in the same molecule by elimination of um, dimethyl oxalate. I will uh, refer to the mechanism of this reaction a little while later. And this molecule we did uh, the antibacterial studies in CDRI Lucknow. And we found that one of the derivatives, then benzyl derivative, had a low MIC value microgram against Staphylococcus ATCC29213. But further studies proved that the compound is cytotoxic. So then we stopped our studies regarding this compound. And very recently, one of my students, she was doing her MPhil then, and um, uh, she defended or opened a few months last month. And uh, Professor Manoj of uh, Kisat was the examiner for her. And so we have developed, uh, she has uh, used a similar chemistry to synthesize the molecules from this two amino thiopyrins from indolo 21 b quinazolin 612 dions. And these compounds are also called triptanarins. They are natural alkaloids. And we submitted these compounds to CDRI Lucknow again with to Dr. Siddharth Chopra. And he found that four of our compounds had very low MIC values, which was very comparable to levofloxacin, which was used as a standard. And the cytotoxicity, very uh, surprisingly, the cytotoxicity also was very low for these compounds. So now we are taking it to the next stage. And these compounds are being tested for the, um, the drug resistant strains of Staphylococcus. Uh, so it was inactive against the same species. So now we are testing, uh, testing these compounds against the uh, Staphylococcus uh, multi drug resistant strains. So we are very hopeful about this project. So we are just on the process of uh, taking it forward. Okay, so with this, let me now uh, come to an, another top, uh, another area where we uh, did some a little bit of work. That is on the semi-synthesis uh, to synthesize an anti-inflammatory compound from ustolic acid. So till now I was talking about anti-cancer, uh, how we are dealing with that, and also about antibacterial. So now I will little talk about the anti-inflammatory property. So before that, let me just tell you what is the semi-synthesis. So semi-synthesis is actually a root which is a partial synthesis where, where the uh, starting or the synthesis starts from isolated natural products. So usually we refer or we resort to semi-synthesis when the precursor molecules are very complex or are very costly to make by total synthesis. Okay, And many of the drugs which are available are actually produced by semi-synthesis, including tetracycline, doxycycline, taxol, tegicycline, etc. Taxol, as we all know, is an anti-chemotherapy drug, which is obtained from the bark of Taxis brevifolia, but it is obtained in only very low quantities. So industrially, it is synthesized from 10 D-acetyl bacatin-3. This is the compound, which is, and this is a natural product obtained isolated in large amounts from the Pacific U tree. So with just two steps from this, you get the taxol. So this is exactly what is meant by semi-synthesis. And uh, we looked into the semi-synthetic potential of this compound. This compound is called ursolic acid. It is a pentacyclic triterpene compound, as you can see here, having immense biological property. There are many reports on the uh, anti-cancer properties of this ursolic acid and few reports on the anti-inflammatory activity also. And uh, this is actually a medicinal chemistry journal, medical journal where they have identified that the anti-inflammatory activity of ursolic acid is due to the suppression of these particular pathways. These are the main pathways responsible for the inflammation. And uh, there are many reviews also available uh, on the bioactive properties of ursolic acid and its counterpart oleonilic acid, which is just an isomer of that. And 
so we uh, summarized that we have to synthesize. Uh, so what we did is, okay, so uh, usually people do an uh, transformation, synthetic transformation on the C3 position. So this is the C3 position, C12 position, as well as the C28 position. Okay, so we were thinking, okay, how, what if we do some transformation on the C2 position and check its activity. So for that, we converted solic acid to its ketone and did aldol condensations with different heterocyclic illidines. So we had uh, suggested several heterocyclic illidines and we do a, a docking, a initial docking study. And we found that it is a thiophene appended derivative which was giving a, a best score. So we resorted the, to the synthesis of the thiophene appended derivative. And together with that, we also synthesized one more derivative, functionalizing the carboxylic acid so that we can prepare a hybrid molecule from ursolic acid by appending an oxidizer core. So this, uh, so regarding the anti-inflammation, so before looking into the inflammation, we have to see what is the so peculiarity about inflammation or what type of molecules do we actually need. So this is the just the schematic uh, synthesis of, uh, sorry, extraction of ursolic acid from osimum sanctum lin. So ursolic acid, if we purchase it from, uh, uh, sorry, so if we start to purchase ursolic acid, just 100 milligram cost around 15,000 rupees and 100 milligram will hardly give us one reaction. So we resorted to the semi-synthetic route because uh, ursolic acid can be extracted from tholosy leaves, that is oximum sanctum, and we could obtain, we could purchase two kilograms of tholosy leaf powder with 1,500 rupees from a firm in Bombay, which is called the Total Health Solution, but unfortunately now it is closed down. So this, uh, this powder purchase from them was used for the isolation of ursolic acid. And if we look into the anti-inflammatory activity, anti-inflammation actually is caused by something called COX inhibition. So the COX refers to cyclooxygenase enzymes, which are responsible for the production of prostaglandins. So there are two COX enzymes, COX-1 and 2. So normally what happens is COX-1 produces prostaglandin, which helps our, which protects our intestine and stomach, whereas COX-2 produces prostaglandins, which are actually involved with the uh, pain and inflammation. So the conventional non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs called the NSAIDs inhibit both the COX-1 and COX-2. So that is why when we, some of us take this uh, tablets like aspirin or naproxen or ibuprofen, we have problems associated with uh, gas, uh, the gastric problems associated with that. So selective inhibition of COX-2 is a very important uh, target in anti-inflammation. And there are drugs which have more than 50% selectivity to COX-2 enzyme, which include, include selicoxy, betrocoxy, brofecoxy, etc. So on a similar line, we were thinking about our compounds. So uh, we initially we did an in silico analysis of these compounds again in our bioinformatics department. And what we found is that the thiazole, oxidizole incorporated ursolic acid produced the highest uh, Lipdoc score, that is, that is the fitting. And therefore, and these are some images of that showing you the fitting of the thiazole oxidizole hybrid molecule to the enzyme. And with this uh, in mind, we, when uh, we synthesized the molecules, so the ursolic acid was oxidized using the Jones reagent and then treated with thiophene to carbaldehyde to obtain our TUA compound. And uh, TUA compound was further used uh, to clip in the oxidizer. So oxidizer was synthesized from this route, starting from methyl benzoate, converted to the hydroside. Then hydroside is treated with chloroacetic acid, then PUCL3 to obtain this chlorodurative oxidizer which is then clipped into this, generating the hybrid molecule of TOUA. And this molecule, actually, uh, we uh, did the in vitro cell line studies, but we could uh, cell study, but we couldn't do this in our uh, biochemistry department. So we had to resort to a private lab in Trivandrum, Biogenics. And, uh, and the result, what they gave us is that a percentage inhibition produced by our TOUA compound was 44%. Okay, which is not very good, but still it is good. Uh, because uh, the known drugs have only 50 percentage inhibition. So our drug is causing almost 44 percent inhibition. So that is the stage in which we are with this type of hormones. But uh, definitely we couldn't take up this work further, but we have to do it. And these are some of the things that we understood from that. So one is we looked into the structure of our molecules. You, many of you might have thought of it that the molecule is pretty large. It has a molecular weight greater than 700. So if we look into the Lipinski rule, so for those who don't know Lipinski rule, Lipinski rule of five is stating that 
there are only uh, lipinski rule is a very important rule in medicinal chemistry although it says rule of five there are only four rules uh, and uh, but all the four rules are in terms of multiples of five that is why the name lipinski rule of five among that one rule is that the, more, the druggable molecule should not have a molecular weight greater than 500 so again we were worried and we looked into the literature and we found that among the fda approved drugs about one third are natural product based which does not actually obey the lipinski rule of five and many scientists therefore believe the rule of five is overemphasized. There is a very good article in Current Opinion Biotechnology 2007 regarding this. And another interesting, something what interested us was, even though there are many synthetic modifications reported for oxolic acid, as I told you at the C3, C12, and C28 positions, hybrid molecules of the sort that we have synthesized are not known, having dual functionality. So we thought that is good. And... Uh, we, keeping in mind that COX-2 is actually considered as a target for anti-cancer drug development. So therefore, combination treatment of chemotherapy with COX-2 inhibitors are very important. So taking into account all the potential for developing the sorsolic acid as anti-cancer agent, we we feel that the current study had a significance in bringing out the dual role of uh, sorsolic acid, both as a COX inhibitory uh, have had, uh, with the inherent anti-cancer protection of these compounds. And this exactly the pentacyclic uh, triterpenes, which is present in our fresh fruits and flower, uh, sorry, vegetables, are the reason why uh, many, many often uh, vegetarians have lesser prone to this cancer. Uh, sometimes I don't know whether it is true or not, but that's what the world says. So that is the reason. The reason is the uh, rich source of pentacyclic triterpenes present in fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, so with this, uh, let me move to the, the next part of our talk. So I told you be, uh, between our synthesis, sometimes we get interested in the fluorescence property of our molecules. So these are some uh, for something related to that. I will just tell you a very small, short story about this because my student who has done this particular work will be soon defending her thesis uh, probably this month. So uh, I will not talk much about that. Anyway, our study started in uh, when I was working in Amrita uh, and my student Akhil was doing this work. Dr. Pradaban there was the uh, one who came for his viva. So uh, we actually synthesized. We were interested in can chemistry because can chemistry is, is, can is cerium for ammonium nitrate. It is a reagent which you can use when you have normal laboratory conditions and you don't have much facility and all that. And uh, I had a uh, experience with can chemistry because I worked with Dr. Vijay Nair, who's, uh, who was a pioneer in can chemistry. Even though I didn't do much of that in my PhD for my PhD, but uh, I could, uh, I had penned a chemical review with Sir regarding can, so that helped me a lot. And uh, what we've observed is that when we use one three dicarbonyl compounds of this sort, and you treat it with can with ordinary using ordinary acetonitrile you will get uh, this particular compound. This is called the vicinal tricarbonyl compound or the 123 tricarbonyls, 123 tricarbonyl compound. And this paper we published in 2014. And ever since that, I have been, I received many emails from many groups all over the world because uh, many of them are interested in this vicinal tricarbonyl compounds because they act as intermediates for the synthesis of many synthesis. Okay. And so uh, having got this compound, we were interested to see what will happen if you use 135 tricarbonyl compounds instead of this 13 dicarbonyl compounds. And to our surprise, what we obtained is not any uh, triketone function, but instead we found that we ended up in the 36 dihydroxybenzene 1245 tetracarboxylic acid tetraalkyl esters. We looked into the literature and found that this type, there's only one single report on the synthesis of this compound that is way back in 1950 where uh, people have used sodium as the uh, oxidant and they were getting only 2% yield of this compound. So we were all able to get 47 to 50% yield of the compound. So that was pretty interesting. And also these compounds the, uh, are, can be considered as derivatives of pyromelitic acid. Okay, when you have all carboxylic acids here, you call it as pyromelitic acid. And from the acid, you can prepare the anhydride. Anhydride goes to the amide and this uh, pyromelitic amides are used for polyimide synthesis, which is useful in space application. So the molecule is important. And what struck us was the fluorescence property of this molecule. When you keep it under UV lamp, you can see a very bright fluorescence on the TLC. So we got interested in this, especially my student got very interested. So what she did was so she actually tried to alkylate the phenol, this compound. And we got the alkylated derivative. And what we observed is that we couldn't see the 
uh, photo uh, when we obtained the alkylate derivative there was no photophysical property or there was no fluorescence so which immediately indicates that the fluorescence is because of this particular hydrogen bonding and uh, we have looked into this so we studied the fluorescence absorption and emission of this compound so this is particularly this is in methanol it is lambda absorption 377 emission there are two emissions one in 454 and 535 so we studied this in detail we did uh, dr jayashri helped us with the theoretical evaluation as well and what we observed is that the uh, second emission for this compound is due to a property which is called ESIPT, excited state intramolecular proton transfer property, which is taking place in polar protic solvents. But when we compared with different solvents, we saw that in aprotic solvents like DMSO and DMF, the emission was very different. Okay, the, all these molecules showed very high uh, stoke shift as well as quantum yield was also appreciable compared to quinine sulfate. But these uh, in the others, the, these always there was an appreciable shift in the uh, wavelength of emission. So therefore, uh, we have come to come up to these structures where the uh, first emission is due to this ESIP phenomenon, where you have the excited state intramolecular proton transfer. Whereas in solvents like DMS or DFF, the solvent interacts with the hydrogen bonding, and therefore instead of this ESIP, what happens is you obtain a dianion. So the species is different. That causes the emission also is different. So we look, again, we looked into the resorted to the literature and we found that ESIPT is a very important phenomenon. This is a very recent article where uh, people have started, uh, where, where the authors have highlighted the importance of ESIP uh, molecule based fluorescent sensors and imaging agents. Even though this concept of ESIPT was brought about by a scientist called Weller in uh, 1940s or 50s on, by studying the ESIPT in methyl salicylate, there are a lot of papers associated with this. The, it is over the last decade that this has gained more importance and other molecules include the benzoxazoles, the, the, the oxidiazoles, etc. also showing such type of ESIP behavior. And we published this paper combining the theoretical and experimental study in spectrochemical reactor. And this is another molecule. Again, I am not describing much because I don't let her, her defend her thesis. So this, uh, in this molecule, so she's my first student from uh, the uh, group, from uh, my Kyoto group. And this is uh, a molecule which interested us because this molecule is actually obtained uh, in a very, by a very simple synthetic rule using the 1,3,5-tricarbonyl compound by a simple aldol condensation with 1,2-dicarbonyl compounds, which we can do under normal laboratory conditions using sodium hydroxide as the base. And when we obtain this compound, this compound is again showing an yellow fluorescence. So what we thought is because we have a number of oxygen uh, donating groups here, we could try some metal binding studies. So uh, we tried to bind different types of metals and we found that uh, only iron, when you coordinate iron to this, the fluorescence of this molecule vanishes. So it is a, like a fluorescence turn off. So we surmise that this can be used for the selective uh, sensing of uh, this iron Fe3 plus. Same way Ashwadi has all had also prepared another compound that was starting from again the same 1,3 dicarbonyl compound, but instead of uh, the benzyl, here we use benzyl to clip, here we use thenyl to, for the aldol condensation. And this compound was not fluorescent. So again, we tried to add different metal salts with, to see whether the fluorescence will come up. And we saw that uh, copper 2 plus caused, a flu caused the fluorescence to come up again. So that is just like a fluorescence turn on. Uh, behavior and so we some we have done more studies regarding the pH and all that so we and we propose that this can act as a uh, sen selective sensor for uh, copper okay and these molecules actually we got interested uh, by looking into a very old reaction the, the reaction of Wies and Cook that was reported in 1968. So Wies Cook said that uh, because at those times we were start studying about these acetone 1 dicarbo 1 2 dicarboxylates so these compounds, 1,3 dicarboxylates, could add to 1,2 dicarbonyl compounds. And we said that it will result in such type of bicyclic ketones. And Cook was V student. And Cook actually established the reaction. And in 1997, he has published a paper telling that if, in, if you use uh, sterically hindered diketones here, instead of getting such bicyclic ketones, you just end up in this type of uh, compound that is the two hyd three hydroxy cyclopentanones. And we also found the same thing when we are when we are using a little bit more bulkier 1,3,5 tricarbonyl compounds. 
we ended up in this 3 hydroxy cyclopentenones so initially apart from the fluorescence we was interested in the study of one 3 uh, hydroxy cyclopentenones for another reason this 3 hydroxy cyclopentenones are the molecules which have pesti insecticidal property okay so this is example of one molecule which is uh, which shows this type of insecticidal activity so this we wanted to prepare such stomach by the chrysanthemic acid we had we need the chrysanthemic acid which was a bit costly so we didn't go for that but these molecules are very interesting because they are insecticides and a very recent review has come out of this uh, pyrethrins these are called pyrethrins they are the compounds having which has insect nerve sensitivity and block the mosquito sodium channel and there, this is a recent uh, review by a japanese scientist and what uh, is very interesting to read this uh, history behind this this is a pyrethrins and he has said that a person called oyama he was the one who found that this pyrethrins can be extracted from uh, chrysanthemum flowers so oyama traveled all around japan and he started uh, encourage people to plant chrysanthemum flowers and take out the extracts and uh, use it as insecticides for their plantations as well as for at home and oyama's wife her name was yuki Yuki found that the extract could be uh, made in the form of a coil, and that is a so Yuki was the founder of this mosquito coil. So these are all this is all history back. So which is which was found to be uh, which is protects our homes as well. So again with this all this reading, I went to the whole newsroom again to see what is the present situation, and what I found that is a map in WHO page which shows that uh, different different color spots. here the red colored spots all indicate that the mosquitoes are being getting immune to these pyrethrins now so wherever it is shown in red it shows that already there is a mosquito has developed immunity and what is shown in yellow is the mosquitoes susceptible to be immune to uh, this pyrethrins and our kerala belt lies in this yellow region so very soon our mosquitoes are going to be immune to the all available uh, pyrethrins okay and a lot of efforts have been uh, are being made globally to tackle this problem and to develop other molecules which can substitute pyrethrins and be in effective to block the uh, mosquito and this is just a recent report on scientific reports by nature which uh, shows the relationship between the insecticidal resistance mosquito age malaria prevalence in anopheles and from guinea so it is mostly uh, reported from the african regions just because of the under overuse and exploitation of these type of pyrethrins uh, so that has led to abuse this abuse of these uh, which has led to this particular problem okay so that is going to be another problem for the future and uh, let me before uh, coming to the conclusion let me just tell you about two reactions because when we do this organic chemistry sometimes we end up in very new reaction pathways which really uh, encourages us to proceed further so one such is this again it's a vidya's reaction where she has uh, did a reaction between ninhydrin so we were interested in the tri polycarbonyl compounds that time so we tr were trying to see what will happen when ninhydrin reacts with nitron in presence of a base like pyrrolidine and but surprisingly what we obtained a compound in which the pyrrolidine also was incorporated we obtained this motif this is called isochromen 14 dione and here the most interesting part is that the role of the nitrone is only to donate the oxygen and then it leaves off as the imine which we isolate as the aldehyde and the amine so we had a lot of problem in publishing this paper and uh, finally uh, my friends uh, dr rajiv smenon as well as dr biju helped me uh, by suggesting a number of uh, techniques by which we can confirm that the oxygen atom is transferred from the nitrone so we have all done all that and we found that the oxygen atom comes from the nitrone alone we looked into the net literature and when we looked in the literature we see one or two reports only where nitrone acts as a similar oxygen atom donor and that is with the help of a catalyst many other many uh, expensive catalyst so this is an uh, catalyst free method where the nitrone just acts as an oxygen atom donor so the mechanism of the reaction goes like this the nitrone oxygen can add here so we propose this is be the mechanism because from the mass spectrum we could see the uh, peak corresponding to one of these intermediates and then the pyrrolidine coming and acting again and the two molecules of pyrrolidine so we have done detailed investigations regarding this chemical characterization and the reaction kinetics okay so this is one reaction which uh, really uh, was interesting and the molecule was fluorescent as well 
but we have not done anything with the fluorescence property of this molecule. But this is a fluorescent molecule with a Stokes shift and quantum yield 0.25 compared to uh, quinine sulfate. And this is another reaction. I told you about this earlier by synthesizing. So we, when uh, Nobel was the person who did this, so he actually uh, took the thino 2 3 indole 2 3 diode and reacted it with this isatillidines. And we ended up in the compound, but we were surprised that how that two carbon atoms vanish off. So that again, we did the LCMS uh, analysis of the extract, sorry, the reaction mixture. And we, what we found is that it happens because of the solvent methanol, which participates in the reaction and takes off this group. And uh, what is eliminated is dimethyl oxalate. And we end up in this product. Okay. So such type of new reaction. So when we looked in the literature, we didn't find any literature corresponding to such a type of reaction. So again, that uh, uh, encouraged us to proceed with this. Uh, so let with, I think we am almost concluding. So let me just tell you that the research on small molecules that is referring to nine molecular weight less than 900 Daltons can lead to the synthesis of hitherto unreported molecules. It can lead to the synthesis of molecules with photo or bioactivity. It can result in the discovery of new reaction pathways. It may lead to identification of lead molecules, which will be a significant contribution. And also it can be extended for material science applications. So before stopping, I would like to remember my alma mater. So all pronouns to my alma mater, the department was looking uh, almost the same from outside, but definitely there are a lot of changes inside. Uh, and these are my dear teachers out there. Many of them are there with amongst you now, Professor Suganan, Professor Kuro, Professor Gish Kumar, Professor Srikumar sir, and Yusuf sir and his dear family. I am very obliged to uh, deliver this endowment lecture in the name of uh, Yusuf sir. And uh, I am very happy that uh, Afsal, Afsal is almost a compatriot of us uh, in terms of age. And Afsal has grown to a well-established music director having his own Wikipedia page in the internet. And uh, th thanks to Professor Onikrishan and Sagura teacher. And of course, my organic chemistry gurus. This is my sir, PhD supervisor, when he came last year to for your conference, Mr. Pradhan, sir. And the, for those who students who doesn't recognize this person, this is Dr. A.G. Ramachandran, who was a retired professor from Pondicherry University. So when we were doing our MSc, Pradhan, sir, was on, out for postdoc in the U.S., uh, and sir returned to us uh, when we were doing our third semester. So the first two semesters were completely taken up by Ramachandran sir. And sir was an exponent in organic chemistry. And he actually enthused many of us into uh, the subject. So I, I bow my back. He's still there in Pondicherry uh, and very active in Facebook. So anybody who wants to contact sir, uh, he actually gives a lot of tips on Facebook, so uh, which will be useful for us still. And uh, this, I also uh, bow my head before uh, Dr. Nalini, who had uh, taught us physical chemistry, Dr. Mohanan, and also Dr. Sri Devi, who had uh, taught us a little bit both of, uh, on uh, inorganic chemistry and analytical chemistry. So, and this is our uh, classmates, uh, our class at, uh, so you see, now I think around 30 students are there for MSc, but when we were learning, we were only nine of us. And I just put this picture to uh, encourage the young students out there, the MSc students, so you can recognize this person standing in blue. He is actually now the scientist in uh, NIST. He's Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf, scientist in NIST. This is Biju, Dr. Biju. He's now in CMS, CMS College Court, as a lecturer. Then the one who's taking this picture is actually not in the picture. And he is uh, in South Korea. So actually, those days, we don't take much photographs. This is the only photograph that we have. And this is my brother, who was then at uh, Bangalore. So when he came for a holiday, he actually uh, brought a camera. So we used that camera to take a class photograph. That is what actually happened. And uh, and uh, what happened is, uh, and this is a person standing at the back is working in the University of Sydney. Her name is Mary. She's in Australia. Then uh, these two people are working with the government treasury department. This one standing at the back is in the bank employee. The one standing here is in a uh, foreign, uh, sorry, is in Gulf country. And one, I am standing over here. And at the back, you can see Raji. She was, she is actually the mild, she was the mildest student among us. And she did her PhD in University of Hyderabad. So you can imagine. And she's working out somewhere there now. So I just put this photo to show you that the MSc students have approached QSAT is at the right place. You have all the exponents in of chemistry out there who can give you any kind of help. I am still benefiting from many of them. 
So this is the right place to be in. And all of us are well placed now in different parts and in different. So with this, let me acknowledge all my teachers and my seniors, my research students and Phil MSc project students to, for having contributed in the work presented here for all my colleagues at the Department of Chemistry, MATCON 2021, our instrumentation facility, uh, uh, CLIF, and then the friends at the Department of Biochemistry and Bioinformatics, ICER and NIST for their support. Then Dr. Siddharth Chopra, CDRI for the antibacterial studies and the funding agencies like DST, CSR and SERP for having funded my research in various times. So with that, let me thank you. Thank you for this very nice opportunity as well to give you this uh, talk at this and as an endowment lecture. Okay. Okay, any deepti. Okay, okay. Sir. Yeah, we are happy to hear you. Yeah. Uh, your explorations in small molecule organic chemistry during the last uh, ten years. Okay, sir. Uh, that's very wonderful journey. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank uh, yeah. you, sir. Uh, and we are proud that uh, you could go very much ahead of us. Oh, no, no, sir, nothing, nothing. <laughs> yeah, the, the student who beats the teacher is a well, better teacher. <laughs> and that normally uh, is happening in uh, as generations go by. And uh, whatever we had done uh, will uh, become part of history and uh, the new generation will pick up and move forward with more enthusiasm and also with uh, more insight. And all the reaction mechanisms that you have shown here uh, gives us much more insight into exploring the wonders of organic chemistry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we are really honored to hear you. Uh, that's a very, it was a very splendid and marvelous situation or location. It was a great opportunity for me, sir. I'm so happy that I am uh, that to that deliver the endowment lecture. Okay. Uh, last year, use of KK Muhammad use of endowment lecture was uh, given by your classmate Yusuf. Yusuf. Okay. <laughs> yes, I think he told us. He told us. Sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the legacy continues. And students, here uh, you can ask some questions, interact with her. Anything special to be asked about in the reactions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, one thing that hasn't changed since you are here and now is that students never ask questions. Ask <laughs> okay, the same story, that has, sir. <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> you never ask questions, and nobody is asking you questions now. Okay, it was wonderful. Nice presentation. Good chemistry, but thank you, sir. Above that, yeah. presentation was excellent. You are doing a wonderful job. Thank like. You. Sri Umar said, and I also used to say the same thing, I suppose, our success will be decided by the success of our students. So <laughs> we can rightfully feel successful when you really attend to talks like yours. Okay, it was good. I, mean, I don't yes. have too many questions to ask because you have done a thorough investigation. <laughs> this is not an MSc Viva or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no questions to be asked here. Okay, Wonderful sir. job. Good. Yeah. Keep it up. Okay. So it's all the training that I received from there. I still remember when we had to give the department seminar, uh, I gave the department seminar and then uh, Professor Srikumar told me it is not satisfactory, you have to do it another time. So I did it a second time. Second time he again told me that it's not satisfactory, you have to do it a third time. And he himself gave me papers on biodegradable polymers and all that. And then third time it was a success. So it is all uh, experience and uh, training received from there.
Mr. Srimar, Professor Pradhaban, and my colleagues, <coughs> and my dear students. <coughs> I am very happy that uh, uh, my own student, Dr. Uh, Annie, has been invited for giving me this lecture. Last time, your uh, classmate, Yusuf, has That's given it. this lecture. So I am very happy about it. It was a very good, nice lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Annie. Uh, and I also thank uh, the organizers of the MatCon 2021 uh, for the including this endowment lecture along with this international conference. It was a great honor for me. I think I thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, we started this MatCon series when Professor Mohammad Yusuf was the head of the department and myself and Dr. Girish were the conveners. So it was the first MatCon. We were there at that time, sir. Okay. Be around 2001 or 2? 2001, 2001. 2001, yeah. We were there. MSc students there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor K. K. Mohammad Yusuf, for your kind words. We were extremely happy to hear from you after a long time. And thanking Dr. Sri Kumar for chairing the session. So here ends the endowment lecture. Now we are moving on to the posture presentations, which will be taking place in Google Meet platforms, which will be in five Google Meet platforms. I require request all the participants to join their respective platforms. All are requested to join back to the Zoom meeting, which is provided in the MatCon 2021 website for the next session at 7 p.m. IST. Thank you. <laughs>